conversation is going to be centered around mobile technologies, mobile trends, um, how that crosses over with technology. I know we have a lot of um, managers and developers and different people from um, across Cleveland, so that's super exciting. So I do want to say thank you for coming out. Um, this is our first event, so hopefully many more to come. Um, and thank you to Mark Staffel. Um, he is a, a member here at the Edgewater Yacht Club, so let's go around. And then thank you to my director, John Chartier. Um, he also helped put this together. He oversees our Cleveland um, branch, so um, let's give a round of applause for him. Apple Pay, hopefully all of you use it. 
um, and you're using KeyBank to change plug. Uh, but uh, we, um, so Apple Pay is big, it's grown the proximity payment or the point of sale uh, market very, very largely within the last year. Um, clients are becoming more receptive. The number one reason why clients aren't using it is because they're concerned about security. That's the number one reason. Um, but then you have things coming out, other device manufacturers such as Samsung, Android Pay, um, whatever other pay is going to happen. And I was at a conference last week uh, in Vegas uh, where Chase announced Chase Pay. So there's going to be other type of pays out there uh, where, where all these device manufacturers and banks um, will eventually want to have your card in, in their wallet. Right? So um, driving transactions through mobile payments is going to be huge. Also, the other thing that you guys are going to hear about, at least in 2015 and beyond, as we think ahead of where clients are going to be. Typically, in digital, at least for the last uh, 10 years, no businesses was necessarily thinking about digital. Only now there's a real investment. So the thing that you guys are going to hear about now is called IoT, so Internet of Things, right? How, do you, how does my car talk to my phone? When I walk into my car, it should already know what temperature I'm um, When I walk into my home, things like Nest, so the connected home concept. Um, and then all these various different companies are trying to grab onto the business. So you guys probably get the emails just as I do around AT&T, ADT, Time Warner, around what they call connected home. So while you're at home, you have your puppy at home, you're at work, you pull out your iPhone and you can see what your puppy's doing, right? So, um, all these various different applications using the internet as a basis to connect people to the things they care about. So look, from my perspective, those are the biggest things um, this year. Has anybody had a chance to develop for wearables yet? What was it? Uh, I actually developed a companion app for uh, one of the game biggest companies. Like it's for NFS uh, run. So we did a companion. like. The companion app is all about like where your friends and uh, other people are. So the companion app for that companion app was it just gives you a notification if someone actually came near your place or when you are racing if someone else is actually trying to come near your place. So we were doing those things. And uh, I work for a I work for a casino based company and Android Wear was there like Android Wear just came up but uh, I did the first app that was 2048 the game on Sony uh, Smartwatch 2. So that was like two years back and that was my first uh, wearable application. You got some game devs here, man. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a market that no one has necessarily, at least from an app perspective, has really grabbed onto. So there's huge, huge opportunity. There's also the opportunity of, you know, same with your mobile phone and your watch as I'm walking by Best Buy. You know, why are you not giving me a coupon for 10% off from driving by, right? So um, those type of experiences where it's location-based is um, you'll see a lot more happening in the next year or two. Any questions? None of that, does that make sense? You want to challenge anything? The, the UI for the wearables, you know, I mean, most of the applications obviously are on the phone or the tablet. Yeah, yeah. They pour over pretty easily from the phone to the tablet pretty easily. Wearable is obviously a major significant platform difference. Yeah, yeah. What kind of things have you seen? Yes, yeah, so limitations, the, et cetera. Sure. So, so the biggest ones, at least um, in my world, is the alerts, so the notifications. Um, the second is um, with the smaller screen size, you're right, um, you're very limited. So, for example, one of the things that you know we're thinking about is making it graphical enough that you can see maybe a small pie chart of your spend, right, as an example. Um, so it's, it, it has to be very readable. Um, showing your balance there might be, might be something um, in, in, in our space. Showing a particular branch that you might be close to. A drop pin on a map on, on the wearable device might be a particular use case. But you're right, it's very limited. Um, and there's very strict guidelines, uh, at least that Apple has out there. As far as how pervasive you can be? Exactly, yeah. So, uh, the wearables thing, so coming back to uh, So I've been trying to do the same use case research and all of the same thing, like how secure is the wearable? Like, 
we can do for them. Let's take an example of the banking app which we want to do it. So, how safe is it to show the balance available on your payroll? Great, uh, great question. So, um, going back to one of my principles, is um, making it quick and easy for clients to perform an action. So, at least in banking, the number one thing that a client wants to do is check the balance. Um, but why do I need to log in to do that, right? So, a lot of banking apps, at least recently, are giving clients the ability to view your balance without actually logging in. Who cares if you steal my phone and you tap on the Chase app or KeyBank app or whatever app and see my balances? I don't care, right? So it's an opt-in model where clients that don't care, like me, um, will essentially say, I don't care, show me my balance without logging in because if I have to log in, it's gonna take me five seconds, maybe I fat finger, and then I have to block myself out, then I have to call or reset my password. So the point is, um, at least balance makes sense to put on a watch um, and giving clients the ability to view their balance, maybe even the last five transactions without having to log in. Yes, I mean, if at all, like, this is a very bad situation where I, I was like, no, don't, we should not show balance on the mobile. That was one of the arguments. We go to a bar, you sit, with a stranger and suddenly you can show you show your how much balance is there on yeah. How safe is it for you to go back home? <laughs> so I mean I'm trying to I mean I love wearables. I mean I as you told the Google glasses, I've been trying all these things. Yeah, yeah. And I saw I mean I'm like how secure is it? Like showing Fitbit and all those things are pretty awesome. Showing mails is good, but Showing balance, is it like safe? It, it, it depends. I think it's up to more of a user preference. It's a user preference. That's why we give the client the ability to kind of opt in. Ah. That maybe, maybe if I had a million dollars in my checking account, I'm not gonna opt in. <laughs> but um, it, for for your normal for your no, normal clients that's on the go that really cares about managing their finances, you know, going back to the banking example managing their finances and to make a buying decision because it's all about giving that client information in that contextual moment that they want and they want to know their balance is because they want to go to Starbucks and Starbucks coffee is six bucks and they only have three bucks in there. Maybe my balance makes sense here because I don't want to overdraft and then actually I'm paying 40 bucks for that coffee, right? So it's, um, you got to be contextually relevant. Follow up on this question um, regarding the, um, you know, the companies like Venmo, this quick pay stuff like that. Yep. So I don't know about keeping but Chase. They, they kind of frustrated me because you know I had a friend that he had a Chase and I had Venmo, and I had Chase. So we tried to set up. It was difficult. How is that going to change for us, like KeyBank or Chase, or then? Moreover, are they banking? Are they all going to combine to use this to take the business model of Venmo or whatever companies like that? So without draft fees, or is there going to be because not only you just anybody has my phone, you go in, Venmo, and then you can send money to yourself with no reality. There's no security in it. Yeah, yeah. So, um, it's, it's, it's funny that you bring that up. Because you guys are probably working on that. We, we are. Um, so, that is essentially person person payments, right? So, there's two aspects. One is around um, the disruptors, which is the Venmo, the Square Cash. You can send money through Facebook Messenger. Um, Snapchat, Snapchat, Snapchat right? Yeah. Those are, for me, that's that's what keeps me up at night, right? Same, same, same thing, like uh, from, from my company, payments through all these. It, it, exactly. So um, how we how we combat that is that we banks can't keep up with the innovation, the amount of disruption that's happening in Silicon Valley. Um, what is happening in the and that's considered in the fintech space. Um, what's happening is, and we we're very open about this. I'm not giving away tra uh, trade secrets. Is that banks, and not only key or key, and not only banks, are open to partnering with fintech companies, right? Not necessarily only to solve the problem that you're talking about, but an array of other problems. Things like um, you know managing my money better. One of the recent partnerships that um, you know part of my job also is looking at um, startup companies that we want to invest in. Or, or maybe even partner with. Um, the one that made the news recently is a company called Hello Wallet that we, um, you know, we partner with to kind of strive to let clients know how they're doing. 
um, financially um, from a financial health perspective. So right now, there's a lot of big, um, you know, a big emphasis on health, right? Wellness and health. Um, so it's a similar type of strategy, but more around my financial health. How am I doing? How am I doing towards a goal? How am I doing towards retirement? How am I doing towards that college? Um, so helping you along the way. Um, so, so I think how banks, to, to, to really answer your question, is um, there's no easy way to solve it. Um, clients will continue to, number one, use the method of least resistance. Um, and usually the me that method is with a, with a startup company like a ben Venmo or a, or a Snapchat. Um, for, for us now, as, as KeyBank, we don't have a P2P solution. Um, we're actively looking at it and evaluating it. But um, it is something that we kind of play very close to the chess. Hopefully that answers your long-winded uh, answer to your question. Sure. I would like to know uh, about the user experience method you use sure. for like developing or designing. Sure. So, so my uh, my team, uh, I have a team of mobile product managers, and um, they and, and eventually I believe that um, user experience professionals will become product managers. And the reason I say that is um, right now they're, they're two very distinct um, job families, but I believe that the user, and this is just my take, user experience professionals will supersede product managers as they exist today. And the reason for that is there's so much emphasis on uh, the client experience and the user experience. Um, that's the number one thing that we're, we're kind of focused on at the moment. Um, and to explicitly answer your question, we take it in three ways. One is we do, um, so my product managers evaluate it with employees. Um, and um, Internally. Get, internally, okay. yeah, internally. And we get, um, we get that feedback, but sometimes with employees, they may not want to tell their real feelings because they work for the company. Um, so second is we do what we call branch blitzes. So we do have a thousand branches and um, we will get out to certain branches and we'll kind of intercept clients as they walk in and say, hey, what do you think about this? Um, give us your feedback. How do you feel when you're using this? Is it easy? Is it simple? Um, what are you thinking? Um, there's never been, you know, so think and feel are kind of number two, you know, top two items to consider when you're thinking usability testing. Um, a lot of companies don't think about think and feel at all, right? So we put an emphasis on how the clients are feeling, the expressions on their face, like we can read that, you know. Um, one of the feedback that we got was like, oh, this is very similar to Tinder, so yeah. But, um, <laughs> which is good, right? Because it's, um, I don't know how many, guys, how many guys are on Tinder, but it's it's very easy to use. Like a three-year-old can use it. So um, doing in the branches, we typically target a hundred or so, and then um, they're key bank clients. And then we do what I call the quantitative aspect that we send it out, where we farm it out to a particular partner, and we get that um, we get those metrics.
understood what it was. They didn't know, understand the difference between user experience, expertise, and then information architect. And, you know, trying to explain to them that we needed both and those two people needed to gel and work together. But I found, and it's been so much easier over the years, it's the data. It's the data that I can bring them and then the proof of um, the experience getting better in our, our ROI on the website getting higher and our usage getting higher. Stuff like that. So I would encourage, it's just, it's just continuous data and updating it, going back and showing it. We do the same thing Key does. We have such a huge user base at all of our facilities. We'll just have incentives and grab people as they're coming in the door and ask them to test stuff. We have huge employee crowds, so we'll ask them to do it as well. And it's actually, my user testing budget is zero, but I have so much because I have such a user base that I can come to know. So, yeah, data is the key. Yeah, I feel like having well defined user stories, which you can use that data to help you build, is really the first place to start as far as everybody in the world of users here. Yeah, but, but even, even before that, I'll hold the whole um, the both that you said. Um, number one, if you are going to focus on the user, you need a persona. A lot of companies do not have the persona. They do not know what they're solving for or who they're solving for. So, number one, um, for all you guys, have a persona or personas of who you're building for. Two is to map out user journeys. You need that. Um, three is you need an advocate. So an internal advocate that's a C-level that gets it. And with that data, if you arm that C-level executive with that data, you're golden. Like, for me, last year I had no budget whatsoever to do usability testing. It was not an emphasis. I knew in my heart, like, damn, I need to, we need to do this. But it was more around um, kind of internal selling first of why it's important using the data um, and who we're solving for and then um, and just making a case for it. And then I think it goes back to your, um, to your comment about, you know, kind of the ROI behind it. Because, yeah, because like if you build something, you know, everyone is building towards a goal. You build something, you put it out there, and the executives, it looks all fancy, um, great UI, whatever. They don't dive into it to the actual user experience or the flows. And what happens is you report on it a week later, a month later, and they're like, why? Why isn't people engaged? Why is there a drop off on this particular app? Well, we didn't do any user ability testing. We didn't do any experience flows. So that's kind of how you tie it back and say, that's why this is important to the business. And it's important to update